how do you feel like with the pieces that you've added, this team is different, improved better than, than where y'all left off last season? Yeah, I think the staff did a great job in evaluating objectively, analytically, like who's returning and how can we make them better and what would we add to the mix. I think that um, thus far, based on the practices we've had and the things that we're doing, I think those ads supplement where we needed help. And I hope that in time, those supplements make the returning players better because it takes some, maybe some of the pressure that they had on them. Um, maybe it makes us collectively better. And so yeah, I think the staff was, that, that happens really fast. And uh, your evaluation objectively on what you need and then objectively studying those guys in the portal, it's that's long before you ever talk to them because you've got to know when you call or when you go see them, your stance on them. And as all that's transpiring, there's probably 10 or 12 more that just joined the portal. And so it's a delicate dance and I don't know that we necessarily know the exact right answer, but I think that with each passing year, I think we've continued to refine it and make it better. One of those that you added, uh, Zurich Phelps, kind of mm -hmm. what his, how do you see his role fitting in with this and how much has it helped that he's had the, the experience playing with Wade and, and Manny before? Yeah, those were probably the best recruiters with Zoo. Um, for, for, for his dad, uh, Mo, I, I think their prior relationship is for sure important. Um, just because Zoo had traction on what's important to us before he ever got to campus, uh, he's been he's been tremendous. Um, wants to be coached, wants to play hard, wants to do the things that we do, and uh, similar to Dex upon arrival, just. As soon as he got to campus, was was moving in the right direction. To that, you talked about how some of these newcomers have kind of worked themselves into the fold. Wade and a couple other guys said they're buzz guys. So, just how have you seen them gel with? You already have such a tight group here. How have you seen them kind of work into that during the off season? Yeah, I think uh, obviously we're an outlier in some regards, uh, maybe because of me for sure, but also we have so many returning players. And so some of the typical issues probably don't get to me because there's so many of their teammates that are telling them this is the way it's going to go. And I, again, I'm not saying that that's the right way. It's just um, CJ is a really good human being, like ultra good human being. Uh, Zoo has prior knowledge of Texas A&M, of the state, of the league, of certain guys on our team. Uh, we recruited Gochi when he was in high school. We were one of two power five schools to offer him. Um, so I think some of that history led to the ability to kind of keep it moving as soon as they got here. Buzz, how nice is it to have a returning veteran roster like this, especially in this day and age, and how did you manage to, to do that? I think a lot of Brent has to do with the just the relationships. Um, all the things that you cover now, you, you can kind of see the importance of trustful relationships, whether that's within a staff, whether that's within a team, whether that's within a program. And I'm, I'm trying to do right by the opportunity just to be a part of it because I don't know I don't know that it'll happen again uh, it's such a rarity uh, to have the depth of relationships that we have with so many of our guys and similar to some of my prior responses like because there's such a small number of new guys with such an over Whelming critical mass of old guys. That's I just don't know that that'll happen 
six months from now over however long it is. And so I'm trying to have more joy for the opportunity to just to be around them because it does have some other era type feel to it. Like I remember when he was here and I remember what he, suit he wore to freshman media day, you know, and there's some, there's some history there. And I think that allows you probably to tell the truth faster, tell the truth more comfortably. I think the truth is received more readily and their sphere of influence has also been a part of that journey too. And I think sometimes that's hard to uh, quantify like the relationship with Solo's mom, the relationship with Four's dad, the relationship with Henry's parents, Jace's, like what is the value of that? Well, it's, it's not quantifiable because uh, a portion of why we have such large returners is the relationships that I mentioned, but it's also the relationships of their people that are not here saying, no, you, you're going to stay there. And, you know, I know it's, it's not the right thing to say in some ways, but like getting a degree from Texas A&M, I think it's still important someday. It may not be the most important thing uh, today, but when their parents think it's important, when we think it's important, uh, now we have multiple guys graduating early, multiple guys graduating on time, multiple guys getting a graduate degree. And I'm not saying that's how decisions are made anymore, but someday when I'm not coaching and they're not playing, I do think the value of that diploma has some positive residual effect. Has that lower level turnover allowed you to kind of get to some phases of just like your calendar quicker, like go through some process? Yeah, for sure. Get to some stuff? Yeah, I think what we tried to talk about as a staff is we don't want to coach two separate teams in regards to, hey, old guys, you don't have to listen to this. New guys, listen, because you've never heard this. I, I think that kind of creates a invisible crack. And so I've caught myself several times actually doing that and then apologize because I don't think that that's fair to this year's team. Because to your point, we're, we are advanced in some of the things that we know because we have so many returning players. Uh, but yet to Travis's point, we have some important new pieces that don't know those tactical things. And so it's important that foundationally we teach it the appropriate way and not just hurry up and appease the old guys. And so I haven't always done a good job of that over the last month and a half, but some of the things that I'm trying to say now is if, if you've heard this before, act like you haven't heard it because I think experts, even in your field, uh, for sure in coaching, uh, the experts are the ones that come to work every day like they're a beginner. And so I need to be the beginner in teaching it. Buzz, uh, Pharrell said that um, he was sold right after meeting with you the first time. So um, can you say what was the spiel to get him so to, to sell him? Yeah, uh, you know, like, Oh, and I don't know. Um, I don't know if recruiting is the appropriate word anymore. I know when you say recruiting, it's identifiable, and so everybody knows. But there's so many uh, components now, and there's so many variables now. And you know this: uh, the rub that you have had with me at times would be maybe I'm too blunt, maybe I'm too honest. But in some ways, that helps in this environment. Hey, is, is money your decision? Yeah, coach. Okay, man, good luck. Because we're not going to win that. And so when I met with him, uh, we, we met at the hotel that I was staying at. I flew there on Easter Sunday, which was not a good thing for my family. And I met with him the Monday morning after Easter Sunday. And he was 
in the hotel restaurant waiting on me. And I remember saying, do you believe in being on time? And he said, yes, sir. I said, I like that. I said, do you eat breakfast? He said, yeah. I said, well, you need to pay for it. He said, okay. I said, do you still want to eat here? And he said, sure. So we're eating breakfast and I go, hey, I remember watching you, you know, in the summer going into what was his senior year. And he's playing on like the, the team that you don't know about that plays in the auxiliary gym. I said, do you remember when I was calling you? He said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Et cetera, et cetera. He's, he's a really beautiful human in regards to his IQ and his EQ. Like he, he has a really good feel. I said, hey, uh, how far do you live from here? He said, 25 minutes. I said, what do your parents do? Well, one, dad's a nurse and mom's a nurse. One works the day shift, one works the night shift. But there's a crossover on when one gets home before one has to go to work, you know? I said, are they at home? He said, I think so, but the shift is like kind of like a fireman where they work maybe three days on or two days off or whatever. I said, well, call him. And he called them. I said, hey, ask him if I can come meet him. And he's like, really? So I just, I said, I'm just going to follow you out there. And so we drove out to the little <laughs> suburb of where he lives and we're leaving. And he said, coach, you're the first coach that's ever been to my house. And I said, are you sure? You mean like since you went in the portal? And he said, no, like ever. And I was like, well, you should have told me that two years ago. I'd have flown up here and done this two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> that was in Minneapolis? Yeah. Um, you know, I met him in the hotel in Minneapolis, but the, I get all of those. Uh, all right. Cottage like Park. Is what his hometown is. Cottage Park? Yep. Okay. Maybe that's what the suburb is. But, Buzz, you have a unique situation where it's not the first real game, but your first exhibition is the last team you guys played last year. It's crazy, isn't it? How, how much are the guys and the team just kind of looking forward to a little bit of rematch and someone they're familiar with? Oh, yeah. I think any time um, you can play a team that's good enough to win a national championship, you want to play them. And it started with – Coach and I were talking about it shortly after we lost. Um, can we raise some money for charity? That would be one thing. Uh, do you have your scrimmages set up? When are they set up? When is your first game? I think this is the first year of my career that you can um, start the season on a Monday. And so this is the first time I've ever had the two that you're allowed that don't count, so to say, in the month of October. And so – not every team has to play their first game on the first Monday of November. So that's why we're actually playing on Sunday, just because of how it all played out. Um, a little bit was the LSU football game. A little bit of it was the timing of their scrimmages when they play. And so, yeah, I think it would be a great barometer to at the end of the month to be able to play against these guys. As a group, what's the biggest area of growth you've seen from this team? Hmm. Well, I, I would say a little bit of they understand the schedule that we're about to play uh, just because it's even more difficult than it was this time last year. I think also the win one, lose one in the tournament and the margin of how difficult it is to have success in postseason. I think there's a little bit of we had to do miraculous things, uh, whatever we were, six and nine in SEC play to get to a nine seed. So I think there's some urgency in the details of what's required to just position yourself to have a chance. And I think the returning players ha have been maybe more communicative in those strands of things. And uh, I think that speaks to their ownership. I think that speaks to the wisdom that they now have. And, and hopefully that allows us to 
continue to progress. And so I also, one other thing that I've noticed a little bit and I've brought it to their attention this past week is because they know all of those things that I just mentioned, they're much more receptive to trying to stay ahead of pace because they understand we're about to play eight games in November and four of them are on the road. So like uh, good symmetry on all of those things, to be honest. The question we asked a lot of the players is how are they different players now from when they were at, you know, the last in the season? Yep. How are you as a coach or your coaching staff, do you feel like different heading into this season um, than when y'all left off last season? Yeah, uh, kind of along that same line, you know, if there was a pie chart of how do you spend your time uh, without your team, you could have a chart of that. And then if you had a pie chart of when you're with your team, how are you spending your time? And uh, so we've been tracking that with the team. And um, I look at it per day but I really study it on Sundays after a week just because I think maybe this time last year, even in years past, maybe uh, too many new people, uh, maybe we're changing uh, a large volume of what we do. I've just tried to be more cognizant of that we're spending the most time on the things that we think happen the most that impact winning and losing the most. And I think we've been more accountable f in that stance maybe than we ever have been. And I think like when you look at our schedule, I think we play uh, Monday, Friday, and then we play Monday, Friday. And then I think we play a Wednesday and then we play a Tuesday, Wednesday, Saturday, what I was just talking to you about out there and then come home and play a Tuesday. And then I haven't studied it completely, but there's more change back forth in the SEC schedule than any of our previous five years play Tuesday, Saturday, then the next week play Wednesday, Saturday, then the next week play Tuesday, Saturday, then the next week play Wednesday, Saturday. And I think when you're, Flip-flopping, we're not complaining if somebody's only tweeting out a portion of this. We're not complaining. But in the in-between game days, how are you going to spend your time? And I think now the time that you have in the month of October, you probably have to be more aware of the things you have to do in that pie chart in the month of October before opponents get involved. Because once opponents get involved, some of that pie chart is going to be specific to the opponent. So I would say that would be probably the largest priority in what we've changed. Well, is this, this the most difficult non-conference schedule you've constructed as a head coach? Uh, I would say so, yeah. And, and why was it important to make it even more difficult than it was last year? Well, I'm more... Um, I know it's never been released and probably won't be released on like how is the net calculated. But there, with each passing year, there's more data. And if you can find enough smart people, they can help you filter through and deduct how it's getting to that point. So every coach is different. Uh, every coach is in a different situation. Uh, relative to their roster, relative to their staff, relative to their tenure of employment. Are you the new coach? Are you the coach that's trying to hold on? Do you have 10 new guys? Like there's a lot of variables. And all of those variables are important. Um, but like from a numerical standpoint, studying quad four, quad three, quad two, quad one, quad one A. You know, that's why there's more neutral site games than ever before. And now when you factor in NIL, that's just going to continue to increase. And then you start thinking through the timeline of if you care about finals week, if you care about having some level of 48 or 72 hours off for Christmas, do you care if you practice Christmas night? When does league play start? 
Um, when is the ACC SEC challenge? Are you at home or on the road? So there's, there's a lot of things that go into that recipe. Um, but I, th I think a few, I know several things that I think are important, but without boring you, I, I think that you have to be willing to stomach, uh, this environment when losing a quad one game. Because mathematically, <clears throat> uh, you want to win. Uh, y your administration wants you to win. Your fans want you to win. Your collective wants you to win, uh, et cetera. But the loss doesn't nearly hurt you mathematically the way maybe other games do. And I think it's like similar to this entire conversation we're having it's hard to predict who's going to be good memphis beat us here by six i think we went six and eight and two possession games last year so 14 games that we played last year were two possessions or less when we played memphis at home it was quad one really hard to do you get to march it was quad three loss and the important people are going hey buzz you didn't play a hard schedule and i'm like okay i understand but you're saying we had a quad three loss and that was used against us but when you schedule the game a series because sometimes not every decision I don't think can be about money. You, let's play Memphis home and home, like old school, like when you were a kid. And when you lose to them, it's quad one. You don't want to lose at home in December. But then two and a half months later, it's quad three. And so I do think right now we're playing a hard schedule. But that's just kind of playing the odd line of a bet. But you don't really know. And so are we going to say in March we played a hard schedule or are we just saying that prior to Halloween? You know what I mean? Because it, it's, it's constantly shifting, you know? Plus you took a uh, number one seed in overtime. You got, like, like we've talked about, so many of those players coming back, including, you know, Wade yep. and the guys you brought in. So I, my, I guess my question is, do you approach personally every season the same or do you allow yourself to maybe be a little more eager about a, the possibilities of a season like that going into it? Yeah, I would, I would say as I've matured, I've tried to treat each one of them individually just because I think each season there's a chapter to be written. I would say early in my career, Olin, I didn't have the wisdom or the foresight or maturity, whatever word you would use. I was constantly bringing up two years ago or last year. I think some of that was maybe because of the early success of our time at Marquette, uh, you know, like three sweet 16s in a row and a lead eight. And I think you just start thinking, oh, yeah, we'll do it again next year. And then – you realize whatever, 15 years later, you're playing one of the better games in the NCAA tournament. And it's it's a one-possession game. It's a two-possession game in overtime, which was the same exact game that we played at the Toyota Center three months before. And you just realize how, how fragile all of this is and how uh, this miss or this free throw blackout or this – unwise turnover just like how 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 fragile it is and so I think to give my best to this group I've tried to be not just this year but over the last several years each team is going to have its own identity each team is going to have its own positives and negatives but to be invested completely with the lives of those on the team it has to be about that team Buzz, now that you said that it's difficult to predict what a team is going to be like, I'm going to ask you what you think of, of this team. You know, what do you think its strengths are going to be, and is this the deepest team, in your opinion, that you've had since coming here? 
Well, so you know, some of those uh, in our time here, uh, we probably had some depth that, for whatever reason, it didn't work out. Um, you know, I think back to some of our losses. Uh, did Henry play? Did Boots play? Did Julius Marble play? Like, there's so many things that today look at the depth and you're trying to figure out where are those 200 minutes going to go. And you're excited about the potential. I am excited. Uh, I do love our team. I do think that we have depth. I do think that you could argue maybe more depth. But we've also seen a lot of unforeseen things happen, um, some of which we could control maybe a little better, some of which we couldn't. So um, I think there were a lot of outlier stats uh, to Olin's question from last year's team. So Texas A&M shot more balls last year than any Division I team in the last seven years. Like, that's a stat I've never been able to say in any capacity that I've been associated with, head coach or not. Well, how did we – how did our offense finish 25th in the country, but yet we – we're among the worst in making a shot. And how does your offense finish 25th? And how do you shoot more balls than any team in a long time? Well, we were second in the country at turnover rate. We didn't give the ball to the other team. And then we were number one in the country in offensive rebounding percentage. So don't, don't give it to the other team. And then we can't shoot. So just throw it up there and let it hit the rim, hopefully. Don't shoot an air ball. And then just get it again and try it again. So I, I don't know that we should measure ourselves on those sorts of numbers. Uh, it, it looks better, obviously, when you can make more shots. But I do think there is an identity in some of the things over the last few years that we hope melds into this year's team. Um, we weren't as good defensively last year as we were the year before and the year before. We slid almost like 20 spots down. But yet our defensive rebounding improved like 70 spots. So we rebounded the ball better defensively, uh, but our defense was not as important. And so... I think there's remnants of things that we think are important. And I do think that we have some personnel to shore up maybe some of our weaknesses, but we don't want to go so far one way that we lose track of what we think is important.